I got this as a gift from my niece. Definitely gonna wear it to work on Monday. And just more random thoughts that I wanna talk about to myself. Um, for no particular reason. Just transforming it from words in my computer or words on pieces of paper to video. And I was, I was thinking again about how the mind screen is the way we interface with reality. And we're interfacing more with the mind screen than we are with people's actual faces. We're not taking them at face value, we're taking them at the value of our valuations based on our thoughts and images in our head. So we have these interference patterns of thoughts and, and images that are somewhat holographic in nature and those patterns and those movies playing in our head actually interfere with us being able to perceive the actual pattern of what's happening right in front of us. And I think that's one of the reasons why people that go into manic consciousness can read reality so well because that ego mind screen interference pattern creator of old past images has has gone away and I actually think that it might be replaced with maybe kind of thoughts and images calculations in the mind screen that are more congruent with actual reality and predicting things and pattern recognition instead of going based on the past ego limited stuff which is like this linear accumulation whereas if it's clear we can use our full perceptual apparatus of our eyes and our heart and our entire being in order to read reality and that's what plays inside and it's actually a lot more information than the linear ego and that could be part of the information overload issue in a way is that now all of a sudden there's so much more information playing on the mind screen which is one of the ways we interface with reality it's almost like that's where our quantum holographic computer is. And at some point that kind of works against us because then we start to make scary predictions about the future, which may or may not be true, or it may be a possibility that can easily be moved away from. So we can either play old tapes or co-create the images and, and words in our mind screen in order to be more congruent and actually co-create and unfold reality. So if we're seeing our ego stuff, we're just unfolding the same ego psychodrama all the time. But if we start to get with reality, we start to unfold with that. And that can be a very, very scary and challenging process. And it's interesting because when the ego version of the images and thoughts on the mind screen is loosened up in the process of manic consciousness, we're able to now play with images and words. So we're able to see something in reality and create new words or see the connection to old words and, and make light of words and create new memes and new meanings and laugh at them and play with them. And at a certain point, they, get, they can get scary, which is a bit of a natural progression of perhaps creating new memes and, and new meaning because it can only go so fast. And if a person goes too deep into their own personal meaning and memeing, then in a way they've isolated themselves from reality and it's a symbolic journey into that ecstasy and it's an equal and opposite scary symbolic journey back it's almost like going into all these beautiful images that we're co-creating with the universe on our mind screen and in reality and then having to journey back through all the, the scary collective images and collective past to get to our personal past the, to our actual personal point in time and space and in history because we've journeyed into this place of mystery and co-creation and we've decoupled from our ego in order to do that because our ego is what keeps us attached to this linear reality but then we have to come back and and almost rejoin up with our ego and to do that we have to kind of walk back through the past and maybe it's even we go into the future and we have to go walk past through all possible scary futures in order to get back to the place in space-time of our ego that matches with our body clock space-time so in a way it could be like inner time travel to 
go into that manic consciousness and time travel into future possibilities for oneself and the world as well and that could play into the whole thing people experience like I gotta save the world and and I feel it's true we each have to do our part to save our own world at least and our own world has nothing really to do with the ego mind um, but that's sort of what keeps us coupled to this space and time and also it's important to decouple from it a bit in order to create a different space and time externally by connecting to a different perception internally which doesn't have to do with one's personal ego reality because one sees in those states of consciousness that that ego reality has nothing to do with reality and if we're able to move into a different place within, we will actually see and co-create something differently. That's why I feel like it's important to talk about it and create the context for more people to say, yeah, that could be possible, and see it that way and sort of be in that place together, which I feel is more safe than going into it by oneself as a personal ecstasy. And I think this is about the universe in a way trying to regain reality is trying to tell us what the actual rules of reality are the actual rules of humanity which have nothing to do with the programmed constructs and it's helping us regain reality and we can create a better game we can be positive social contagions we can we can be our embodied manic self and not even necessarily say a word and just change the world through gesture and nonverbal communication and this is what my niece with autism does she does a lot of nonverbal communication and she's really good at it and in a way there's a large population of people that probably pick more pick up more on the nonverbal communication than verbal and they can read us and if we think oh well they're behaving badly they can read our energy no problem. So if we aren't in that complete state of just being completely unconditionally loving, they are going to know. They're almost like the new human lie detector test. It's all a test of unconditional love and not a test as in we're being tested, but it's actually how reality and the laws of humanity are designed. So it's almost like the laws of the human nervous system. So we can be verbally very wonderful, but if we're energetically awful and saying negative things inside, that information is energetically av available to people who can pick up on it, even if they can't hear what you're thinking in particular. So the human nervous system picks up on these things. It picks up on those subtle vibrations. Our cells pick up on those subtle vibrations. We have vibration sensors on our cells as receptors. So some of the receptors on our cells are for signaling molecules and some are for certain vibrations and that makes different intercellular changes and genetic changes and epigenetic changes. So how one is actually being energetically has a healing effect or not. That's why people, some people feel very healing to be around and some people don't, even though maybe on paper they should be a healing person, but they're not. So that's why the Soteria model didn't pick people based on their clinical knowledge. They picked people based on if they could be with people who are in extreme distress. I created the words Perceptio diversity and experiencio diversity, meaning being okay with other people's experiences and perceptions and not judging them. And I think part of that actually would be more people having the approach of open dialogue or dialogue as opposed to discussion and judgment and and throwing opinions at each other, but just really being open to what people are saying. And there was an example I, I saw in this training I did where if somebody has dementia and they say, oh, I gotta go to work. The worker doesn't say, you don't work anymore. They say, 
sure, let's get a cup of tea on the way. So they, you know, grab a coat and put a, go get a cup of tea in the kitchen area of the home. In the same way, people, I know that's what they do in the Soteria model. If somebody says, I have to go outside because the aliens are coming to get me and I need to, you know, be out there meditating or something, the worker will go with the person and, and go with what they're experiencing, not shut down their experience. And by doing that, eventually, at some point, a, per a person is able to go through all of that stuff and sort of reintegrate back into reality. And because it's seen as something that's temporary and a manifestation of someone's distressed or just transformation process in general and not, oh, this person is ill. I thought of as part of the business I want to create to create a human distress crew with people trained in the spiritual emergence paradigm as well as ECPR, TRE, and all these other things. And I was thinking it's sort of training a different kind of peer support worker. And in a way, the people don't necessarily have to have lived experience with a mental health diagnosis because in Soteria, they didn't really hire people that had lived experience per se. And I think sometimes it's difficult for people with lived experience to be with someone with such extreme distress because they've experienced the spectrum of that distress. So it could be possibly more distressing for the individual. Because that's what I'm realizing being working in the system is re-traumatization or vicarious trauma. I was sort of just thinking that I'm actually more susceptible to allostatic load, which is a term I heard from Dr. Daniel Siegel, which basically means accumulated stress. So if I've been to that extreme state of distress myself, it's it's likely that I'll have less tolerance for more stress. And so I can maybe provide good perspective, but I don't know if I'm the best person to be supporting people who go who go through these extreme states of distress. I would love to be one that is able to create a framework for people to be able to get trained in such a way to support people through those distressing times and support me through those distressing times too. But I don't know if I'm the one to actually do that kind of work. And there's a lot of amazing people out there who can do that kind of work. So the human distress crew, and it's a community crew, I thought of it as I heard a term here, clubhouse without walls, which was like the clubhouse paradigm, but without the actual building. I don't think it worked out, but I was thinking, imagine Soteria without walls, which is people who are Soteria, people who are Soteria model, just like they train people to be to have mental health first aid, these people would be trained to help with distress without pathologizing people. And maybe some people need and want to be pathologized, but I think there's also a space for people not to be. And I feel this could actually really help with people, especially youth perhaps, who are waiting a year to see a professional. There's this long wait list and what happens in the meantime? Maybe there's some distress that can be helped with and maybe some of the need for a person to actually see the professional is mitigated. And I don't know if that's true. And I'm not trying to take away from the need for professionals. I'm trying to add some kind of help for the distress in the meantime. I was thinking that the ego is like saliva because it's sort of equivalent to Pavlov's dog. So we think of a thought and then there's some pleasure which is just sort of like the dog hearing the bell and then drooling. So basically we're just sort of salivating all over ourselves and creating our own bells to make us think that that's actually food 
when it has nothing to do with it. We're actually just wasting our molecules by creating all this saliva when there's no actual food there. And the actual food of the universe, what really fulfills us, is not something that we can think about. I think I talked about before how the ego collapsing wave functions interferes with the universe collapsing wave functions. And us also participating with that process of the universe collapsing wave functions. We really need that clear screen. When the screen is clear, we see something and what arises on our mind screen holographic processor is something that is actually congruent with reality and since it's congruent with reality, it brings us joy. I feel like if it's congruent with reality, it brings us something of those inner human dimensions that aren't divided up by our thoughts, which is just about the past. So it'll actually allow us to receive the perception of a tree and how beautiful it is and we'll feel that beauty when if we're just talking about something in our head we're not going to see that and we're not going to feel that. I also think that the ego is like throwing ketchup at your brand new TV. Buy a brand new TV with this crystal clear screen and high definition and then smothering it with ketchup and thinking that you're going to get the best viewing experience. And the ego images that get in the way of this quantum holographic impression that we take of reality. We take full impressions and then we can make different abstractions in a way from it. So it's like abstracting beauty and love and all these things that are related to the truth about humanity instead of abstracting old ego concepts. And when we're abstracting beauty, we're communicating from a different place. We are that beauty when we abstract it and that gives us energy in a different way that would create epigenetic changes when we're always perceiving beauty and also when we perceive it we start to learn how we're able to be it and share it because if we can do that with a tree and then all of a sudden we can do that with another person we can look at them and see how beautiful they are we're going to relate to them differently if we can see like wow like look at that creature it's just amazing versus picking apart little judgment bits like we usually do we can either size people up or we can uplift them. I was on a website the other day that was LGBTQ2. They actually had a page on their language, different terms they would like to be used in reference to their genders and sexualities, which is helpful for people that don't know that language. They don't know how people would like to be spoken about and referred to and or how they choose to talk about themselves. So getting on board with the correct language of this new um, orientation or at least new awareness of these orientations now that it's safe for them to come out and express themselves to some degree. Um, same with for me I feel and this what I'm talking about in the context of manic consciousness and say having bipolar disposition and having this manic consciousness that sometimes I have access to and how I don't think it's a personal thing, how I think it's something to do with the collective humanity just as a person who has a different gender, maybe transgender in some way, didn't choose that. That's how they are. I didn't choose to go into manic consciousness. So I feel like maybe some people, you know, their inner experience didn't match with the body they were given and they change it. Um, and they're able to in today's times, which is great. I feel also that my inner experience doesn't necessarily match with my body in that 
sometimes my inner experience changes in such a way that I don't feel like my identified ego self. So that has nothing to do with my physical body. I still feel like I'm a woman, you know, most of the time. Actually, sometimes I decouple and I think I feel like a homeless man. Um, and I've also felt like Jesus, and maybe Jesus was a homeless man, and maybe it's the same spectrum of consciousness. Who kn Who knows, right? So in the same way that people are able to change their gender, I seem to be able to have a different spectrum of consciousness which isn't always keeping me the same. So because it's not a physical thing, I can go in and out of that and it's somewhat invisible. Just as somebody who is born in a woman's body but who identifies as being male in whatever sense of the proper terminology but just by looking at the person you wouldn't know that inside they feel like they were meant to be born a man or meant to be born the way they were but transition towards being a male identity or however it works for the individual I'm sure it's um, a very rich experience and it depends on the person just like people who go into altered states of consciousness, it's not all the same for everyone. Not everybody had the exact same experiences that I did. So we're each a unique manifestation and I feel it's part of actually the evolution of the complexity of humanity, which is necessary mathematically as well as um, just how it is to be human. So this community of people have their own terms of how they'd like to be spoken to, spoken about, referred to, and how they talk about themselves. And I'm sure it's going to evolve over time as more people start to say, that label doesn't fit me. Maybe no labels fit anybody. Maybe we're all just completely unique expressions beyond labels. Just as they have a new transgender language, I... And the thing with that too is the language is only for the purposes of communication in a way because if a person changes genders and nobody knows, they would just be assumed to be that gender that they have changed to be. So they don't even need the language in order to explain it. Um, maybe they only need it in order to actually justify their existence if somebody either finds out or if they choose to justify their existence by talking about their journey and their experience, then it's important to have that. So with me, if I n never chose to say, I was diagnosed with bipolar, never chose to work in the mental health system. No, I could probably hide it um, in my daily life and then if I went to the hospital I could hide it somehow from people if I really wanted to and nobody would know. And what I'm saying is then I would never need to create some of my own words and language around how I like to think about my experience and how I choose to communicate with myself, at least, about my experience. So people with the transgender language and different terms, other people might not see it that way and might choose to not use that language. And that's unfortunate, or may choose to not um, educate themselves enough to, to understand how to communicate in a compassionate and loving way with people who are on that courageous journey and and again it's about being my being oneself and uh, I've talked about how Sean Blackwell said bipolar disorder is I can't be me disorder well a person if they feel they need to transition in some way if they feel they can't transition they're likely going to develop some kind of 
mental health thing because they're thinking about stuff that they can't resolve. So in the same way with the manic consciousness, um, it feels like I'm making these videos because I have to talk about it. I have to get this out of my system. I have these memes inside of me. And I feel in the same way if somebody was transgender and created a word that described them and how they're comfortable being talked about and referred to and how they want to talk about themselves and then all of a sudden they are in contact with 10 other people who are like yes I like that word I like that term that resonates with my experience at this point in time it could change at a later date and so that's a helpful word not just for communicating with each other and people who are not necessarily of that orientation or disposition but also with oneself so I could call myself mentally ill I could call myself bipolar disorder I could call myself psychosis psychotic um, the term manic doesn't really bother me um, sometimes it's referred to as say like maniac which is related to mania and I feel like they don't really talk about the stigma of mania too much because they just don't want to talk about mania too much because it's so amazing in its feeling and they they don't psychoeducate about mania the, the most they do is say oh do you feel like you're special in reference to psychosis but they never really talk about they they lump it in with psychosis they never talk about mania because maybe people would kind of want it so they talk about the fallout and they talk about all the sad stuff they don't talk about oh my gosh the people that are too happy so again with this language I feel like it's sort of the language of transformania it's like a transformation happening and it's through manic consciousness and there's transgender and I'm saying there's transformania which it sounds like it's transition for mania and so it's kind of a language of transformania and the interesting thing is that in mania and manic consciousness people often create new words and language and play with words and feel quite poetic I remember the very first time I thought I was gonna be a rapper and I created like rap lyrics and I was rhyming all the time I didn't actually really say them out loud but I was writing them down and I thought I was gonna be friends with Lauren Hill for some reason like I thought I was gonna send her some lyrics and she'd be like yeah this is so great we'd be friends and I listened to this rap song by this young woman on YouTube and she was and I can't find it since then I don't even know what it was but I could just understand everything she was talking about made complete sense I guess that's what it's like when one is one with one's experience just like yeah I get it like I understand there's no needing to try to understand it's sort of an effortless learning and understanding process and that actually could work against us in the long run because it's scary to understand too much sometimes and it's nice to go back to chemicalized ignorance to be able to get through the day and not understand some of the things that are going on in reality by by just breathing so so yeah the language of transformania